everyone. My name is Sarah Bedford, Program Manager for Social Integration at HIAS. Thank you for joining and welcome to April's Preferred Communities Learning Circle on Untangling SSI and Introducing SOAR. I'm pleased to introduce Jen Elder, National Policy Partnerships Coordinator for the SAMHSA SOAR TA Center, who will take us through an overview of the SOAR model and moderate today's webinar. Jen? Thank you so much, Sarah, and I want to welcome everyone to this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and learning more about SOAR and Social Security Disability Benefits. Um, to start off with, for those who might not know, I'll uh, define SOAR is SSI, SSDI, Outreach, Access, and Recovery. So through today's webinar, we're going to be talking about about security disability benefits for non-citizens and how the SOAR model may be um, used to, to help the individuals that you serve. We'll start with a few disclaimers. Uh, the training is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, DHS. The course of this presentation do not necessarily re reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA or DHHS. Um, also, the training should not be considered a substitute for individualized care and treatment decisions or a substitute for the full SOAR training, which we'll talk about near the end of the presentation. For quick instructions, uh, everybody's line will be muted throughout the webinar today. Um, portions of the webinar will be recorded and available within one week of today. Um, it will be posted on the web link that was on the opening slide. And, so, and I believe it will also be posted in the Q&A box, a link to that article where you can find copies of today's webinar, the PowerPoint handouts, other tips for, um, for working with the non-citizens, um, and while you're there, we invite you to explore all the resources that are available on our website. Um, downloading documents, that's probably the easiest way to go, or you can go to File, Save, in the top, the top uh, left-hand part of the WebEx room, um, and then save the documents from there. Time for questions and, and answers at the end of the presentation. But if you have those as you go along, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box for anything that technical in nature, we can solve those immediately, um, but questions for our presenters will hold to the very end. So uh, today, I'm going to talk just very briefly about a SOAR overview to set the stage for what is the SOAR model, why is it we'll be talking about it today. And I'm pleased to be uh, joined by Diana Varela from the Social Security Administration, who's going to cover Social Security Disability Benefits for Non-Citizens. Then Gerardo Benavides from the Healthcare for the Homeless in Baltimore, who's going to talk through the SOAR process for refugees and non-citizens and talk about all of his great tips from working in the field, uh, helping people access disability benefits. Wrap up with a few slides about the SOAR online course and next steps, and then have time for questions and answers. So I started just with the basics of the SOAR model. Um, I already mentioned our goal is to increase access to Social Security disability benefits um, for vulnerable individuals. Focus on individuals who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness and have a serious mental illness, co-occurring substance use disorder, or other physical disabilities. We are sponsored by SAMHSA, and we've worked in collaboration with Social Security since 2005. A really great thing about SOAR, and particularly bringing together um, people from all over the country today, is that SOAR uh, is active in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. And so we'll talk a little bit later about how to connect with SOAR in your area um, and the local leadership there to, to, to get more involved uh, with this model and increasing access to these benefits. Through your work, you no doubt have seen how critical income stability is in accessing housing, treatment, and other support services. And so our goal is to help make the process for accessing these benefits for individuals who are eligible easier, quicker, so that we can help people obtain housing stability and accessing treatment, employment, and their, um, you know, just 
goals in life, decreasing hospitalizations, and really providing a foundation for recovery. What makes us unique is that we have a proactive, comprehensive approach to helping with Social Security disability applications. Uh, we know that this process can be daunting and confusing as, as many processes are, you know, with applications and forms and medical records, and that's why SOAR is here, to walk people through, be there every step of the way in obtaining the documents, fill out the application forms, uh, kind of translating the jargon from Social Security into, um, you know, easy to understand information that helps people feel empowered through the process and, um, you know, not scared to start these applications to access these uh, critical benefits. We have strong collaborations with our community partners. And so, you know, I'm so honored to have Social Security with us here today. Uh, the Social Security Administration made a non-medical decision on and is, you know, one of our, our uh, strongest partners with this because they administer uh, SSI and SSDI, the disability benefits. Um, the eligibility rules are the same in every state, and so we work hard to help connect our and local SOAR leads with SSA contacts to, again, help this partnership um, work really smoothly in applications. Um, every state also has a disability determination services that works uh, with SSA to make medical or disability determination. Um, they're often an unknown player in the process, but absolutely key to making this work. So again, we um, part of what the SOAR TA Center does is help strengthen those collaborations um, and, and help identify contact people in uh, every state. Medical treatment providers are extremely important in gathering the medical evidence, maybe helping people obtain conversations or uh, needed evaluations. And partners at criminal justice vet, uh, organizations, veteran affairs, employment, housing, refugee resettlement uh, organizations help to ensure that uh, individuals served by SOAR are receiving comprehensive services and that we're not operating in a silo. And so part, uh, part of the way that we can kind of, uh, you know, so that we're not operating in a silo is showing you how much support is available through SOAR. And so, you know, you're not alone. If you're interested in SOAR, uh, I'm so excited to hear that. And over the course of the webinar, as you learn more, know that we have a structure in place that you will be supported, um, you know, as you reach out for interest and as you, as you start to explore more about the SOAR model. At the SAMHSA SOAR PA Center, that's uh, where I'm at, and we help facilitate the online training course, and we provide technical assistance at all levels. We are we're here for everybody. We have state team leads that are located in the state and help um, bring together community organizations, provide um, technical support at a closer level, and local leads who also provide that support, and case managers uh, are key. We need a as individuals to help with these applications. Um, and so the way leadership structure looks is slightly different in every state, um, but it's there and we all work in tandem to ensure that everybody is supported and, and most importantly, that the you know, people that we're serving that are vulnerable and in need um, get help that they need. SOAR works. Uh, we promote this model because we have strong outcomes in helping increase access to these benefits. Our cumulative outcomes up until uh, 2017, um, over you know, the past 10 plus years, we've helped almost 35,000 people access these benefits on the initial level. So that's avoiding the need for an appeal um, and getting those benefits quickly. In the teen, our average approval rate was 64% in about 96 days. So uh, when we look at comparing that with the average approval rate, you know, without assistance is about 28%, and typically even lower for individuals experiencing homelessness, we can increase that up to an average of 64% success on the initial application 
in uh, in just about three months. And so, um, showing that our model really does work. Um, and for all of those critical components that I just briefly mentioned, and that are covered in much more depth in the store online course. So now I want to turn it over to Gerardo Benavides. Uh, he started working with refugees in the case management department at the International Rescue Committee located in Baltimore, Maryland in winter of 2013. He became SOAR trained during his time at the IRC where he first started working on help, helping clients apply for federal disability benefits. He did jobs in fall of 2015 working as a disability assistance outreach specialist at Healthcare for the Homeless, also in Baltimore, where he helped clients to apply for federal disability benefits through the SOAR process up until fall of 2017. He continues to work for Healthcare for the Homeless as their community relations coordinator, where he continues to advocate on behalf of immigrant clients who are served by the agency. All right, Gerardo. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me. First and foremost, again, my name is Gerardo Benavides, and I work at Healthcare for the Homeless currently as our Communities Coordinator. Most of my SOAR experience has come um, here at Healthcare for the Homeless, but also in my past work at the IRC. So hopefully you find this presentation very helpful. Um, just kind of go over a quick overview. I'm just going to go over some of the background that Diane actually went over, um, go over some other textual as far as as far as like mental health and refugee and immigrant communities go, and as Jen has already mentioned, go over next steps or pro tips, as I would call them, um, that had helped various clients from various different backgrounds apply for disability benefits. Um, and just like to to quickly preface this, um, while I have worked as a benefit specialist, a lot of this information is definitely applicable across. The spam of helping people apply for benefits, so um, through the SOAR process, but also through other processes. Um, so where we are, um, okay, let's see if this works. So this first slide goes over who is eligible for SSI. Um, so as everyone probably knows, there are special considerations for non-U.S. citizens who may be eligible for SSI. So as um, SSA defines it right now. The folks who are non-U.S. citizens who can apply for disability, disability benefits are permanent residents who've worked 40 qualifying quarters. So that's there are four quarters to every year. So that would take about 10 years or more. Probably not within your population within newly arrived refugees or asylees. Um, but again, it could be possible that later down the line, um, at some point, somebody will want to apply for SSI benefits. Any veterans with honorable discharge, any active military a spouse or unmarried dependent child of a veteran or individuals on active military duty, um, any legal permanent resident who came here after uh, or as of August 22nd, um, and a lawfully residing resident in the U.S. who is receiving SSI benefits. Um, this is just to provide some background, some context. just want to go over this really quickly. Diana did a great job of going over some of this um, before. Transferring over to the next slide, which this might more into the population that you all might be serving. So immigrants who are eligible for up to seven years of benefits include refugees, asylees, and any immigrants whose deportation is being withheld. Um, that last bit, typically who are applying for asylum, can also or may also be granted um, like a withholding of their deportation by an immigration judge. And while that allows them to um, remain, it, it, it is sort of like a step rights wise as far as like being into the asylum status goes, but they are eligible. I saw that somewhere in the Q and A, um, someone had mentioned like, what about the uh, Cuban or Haitian entrance? And that's another group that is on this slide, but are eligible for up to those seven years of benefits. So anyone admitted a Cuban or Haitian entrant as defined under the Refugee Education Assistance Act. Um, Anyone whose status they can be treated as a Cuban or Haitian entrant um, may apply for SSI. And so one last group, any mayor Asian immigrant, quote unquote, pursuant through other SSI um, risks are also eligible. So uh, we'll keep going. So again, they're eligible for up to seven years of benefits. What does that really mean? Um, so it means that upon arrival, if someone were, were to have arrived on January 1st of this year, they are eligible for up until January 1st of 2025. 
I believe, so seven years after that, um, can apply for at any point between then. Um, at the end of those seven years, so after granted the, those seven years of status, um, so if they wanted to apply a year after arriving, they would only be eligible for after six years at that point um, if they ended up being disabled within that time period. Um, so once approved, you know, the, 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 the proverbial clock kind of goes ticking until someone is able to, uh, until um, the individual or the claimant is able to apply for other forms of citizenship. Um, and so that's that's typically what you, an advocate, what you, a provider, um, would have to work on doing is that after applying for benefits, kind of understanding, okay, they might be eligible for only up to seven years of benefits, can get that citizenship process started as soon as you can. Um, so, and I know Social Security does a fairly good job of also sort of reminding folks, um, reminding SSI recipients that subject to their eligibility, they do need to contact USCIS and try to get in touch um, to to apply for, for their citizenship to make sure that their benefits don't run up. Um, sorry, it's working. Here we are. Um, so just some quick background information, and this might be going over some stuff that some of the providers and some of the advocates on the line might already know. Um, but within the context of refugees in particular, um, mental health is a prevalent issue within this population. Um, and there is a prevalence of mental health issues that varies depending on the migrant group. So typically, um, as trends show, like refugees deal with issues um, somewhat, somewhat similar to other immigrants, maybe people who have come here quote unquote legally, um, or or through other means that refugees are here legally, but um the the path of what you take to get here um may contribute to certain types of mental issues you might be dealing with. So as a, as a states, the state of the migration trajectory um does affect certain exposure to certain risks. So there have been studies that have shown that, you know, within the pre migration stage, within the migration stage and within the post migration stage, exposures to certain things may certainly affect the issues you may be dealing with further down the line. Um, as a refugee, as an immigrant, um, I think what else? And there are, of course, other factors that influence mental health issues experienced by refugees and experienced by other immigrant populations. The state of migration is one, you know, just one cog. I mean, there are other factors, culture, where people come from, um, certainly the countries they come from, shape their symptoms, their diagnosis, subsequent treatment they're going to receive, um, unity. And people interact with their family, with their larger community, also sort of affects their mental health issues. Um, communication, being able to really communicate what's going on, um, being able to have resources available at these stages to communicate or to be able to communicate what's going on, also very ties into sort of the uh, the overall issue of mental health when it comes to to immigrant populations. Um, just to kind of keep going along with some of these stages and sort of noticeable characteristics and trends within the immigrant population. Pregration tends to coincide with disruptions to social roles and networks. Um, this is typically seen before people are uprooted. Um, so I'll uh, put it like I'm sort of looking into what people's roles are prior to leaving, um, I think would be a way to just kind of look at it during pregration. Um, um, there's there are other characteristics and other trends that people are exposed to. There's a prolonged uncertainty about you know where to call home, where to call home, where to call yourself a citizen from. Um, there's there might be a propensity or a greater possibility of exposure to violence, harsh conditions depending on where people go, whether it's refugee camps, whether it's uh, uh, cities, whether it's other countries, how they're received. Um, so that the migration state can definitely affect individual mental health. Um, and then, you know, there are certain characteristics associated with post-migration. So um, in this case, after your clients or your people um, are to, to the country that they're going to be resettled in, so that they're resettling in, um, I mean, some trends have showed that there's something called the healthy immigrant effect for some folks where, you know, there's that sort of elation phase. They're somewhere stable, somewhere where they're going to get services, and that initially has like a quick positive effect, but that it tapers very quickly, um, that there is this initial period of hope and optimism, but afterwards it can quickly devolve into demoralization as people 
people navigate that resettlement process. Um, and so just, again, like, this is just background sort of context. Um, and kind of keep going. So some concerns and risk factors. Let's go this through quickly. There, there's the, the risk of forced displacement, or the, actually the very real um, perceived problem of forced displacement. There is extensive exposure to traumatic experiences during conflict, um, during the migration phase, during the post-migration phase, as we know. Um, some places can't be welcoming. Um, so walking in camps, even while resettling, there, there could be more extensive exposure, um, different form of torture, violence, abuse. Um, and then another concern or risk factors, and especially within the context of applying for Social Security benefits, a lack of access to quality health care and education. So lack of access to health care and education can lead to, can ex certainly exacerbate um, somatic problems, like physical health problems. So it can lead to malnutrition, um, chronic conditions that people might deal with. Um, and lastly, if they, people don't have access during that migrate during the migration phase of having access to like a therapist or psychiatrist, then mental emotional burdens certainly become heavier during um, during this of of individuals coming into to this country as refugees, asylees, or other immigrants. Um, concerns and additional additional resettlement concerns certainly like in that last post migration phase. Um, I know that in my in my time working as a as a caseworker that sometimes there was limited access to some preventative health coverage. Um, in today's day and world, um, there's dental coverage through Medicaid for children, for example, but there isn't always readily available Medicaid coverage for dental for adults, and that's always an issue. Um, sometimes it's also hard to, to connect folks with, with mental health uh, services upon arrival just because of a lot of the things that need to be navigated. Um, other resettlement concerns include, again, this broad, even health healthcare system to our to people who have been here for a while, um, can certainly be hard to navigate for for for, for refugees, for asylum, for for other immigrants coming into the country. Um, there are environmental stressors, so even just adjusting to life, adjusting to a new environment, can can certainly um, make that decision a lot more difficult. And, and Last month, and, and sort of, and this will be touched upon a little bit later, um, and certainly over and over again, but cultural responsiveness and um, what I like to call sort of humility among healthcare providers. So, among like school primary care providers, amongst mental health providers, uh, how responsive, how I don't want to say culturally competent, but how um, amenable or humble our providers to the individuals they're serving. Um, and we'll touch a little bit about, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but you know, how, how, how do they respond to like certain cultural cues or is language access available? Um, that can certainly all create barriers when it comes to access services and certainly further down the line can make it very difficult when it comes to applying for disability benefits. Um, so, in, in my time as a caseworker, um, both at IRC but also doing store work here, there was sort of always this constant, well, I'm helping, so if I want to help someone apply through the SOAR process, sort of that first step is, okay, what is their mental health history? Have they received recent treatment, um, with diagnoses, past medical records? Do I have access to that? And a lot of times it was very difficult to have access to that, especially for newly arrived refugees, for immigrant groups who may or may not have those docu documentation ready. Um, I know, you know we would get a collection of medical documents, you know, bio data, stuff of that nature um, that would sort of have a brief medical overview, but nothing completely in depth that would necessarily get at um, sort of the underlying issues in, so, in some respects. For some clients, it was that was the case, but for others, it wasn't. Um, and what keeps refugees and other immigrant groups from accessing not only mental health services, but also other health services during resettlement? There's the needs. Um, so upon resettlement, I know a lot of folks and you know a lot of caseworkers, a lot of other affiliates um, are certainly 
it's more worried about sort of how is how someone going to pay the rent. I got to help them find housing. I got to make sure their somatic health issues are are kind of covered. Um, for resettlement agencies, I mean, there are like requirements of making sure you do things a certain way, making sure documentation is covered. Um, I sure you kind of connect the dots and go down to the list of making sure people are sort of settled in, in certain aspects, um, which can certainly um, folks to overlook. Okay, we need to connect them to mental health services or or other providers outside of that. Um, language is always an issue, and that's another resettlement concern that kind of cut pretty often. Um, so between the patient and the provider, not knowing about it, like for the patient, not knowing there's available interpretation, um, and also sort of that big trust between an interpreter and a patient. Um, so there's the access bit, but then if there are interpretation services available, how how much of the client, how much is the patient, um, yeah, trust interpretation? Is it over the phone? Is it with an in-person provider? Is it someone in their family, which it shouldn't be because anyone receiving any kind of federal funds is obligated to provide an interpreter at no cost? Um, is So again, trying to navigate sort of that, those language barriers. Um, with, with your clients and with the people you're helping apply, you know, ability uh, benefits, whether or not you're tend to go see a provider or whether or not you're taking them to Social Security in general, I would always emphasize that your client does not have to bring their own interpreter, that again, these these places that receive federal funding are always required to provide an interpreter of some sort. Um, I think this is to provide objectivity. This is to maximize sort of the good that everyone can do in that situation. Um, I think about language, depending on the condition that your client is applying for, you can just make sure that, that that interpreter is um, trained in whether it be mental health, whether it be somatic health, whether it be something as specific as uh, a colorectal cancer, that they have a background in that medical interpretation because there are different forms of sort of interpretation. Um, and so it could be uh, that of an issue further down the line. Um, and of course, poor and confidentiality with the interpreter is always critical. Um, and last but not least, as far as resettlement concerns go, there are always cultural barriers involved. Um, depending on where the individual comes from, there can be a certain form of stigmatization as it comes where, where it comes to access to mental health services. Um, and certainly, there are cultural differences with regards to how people react to symptoms, with how they react to explanations, with how they cope, their adherence to treatment, their relationship to their family and their providers, whether or not they're willing to receive help. Um, and so understanding all of those things may need to be navigated as you're connecting people to services they need to, again, provide the first step to helping people apply for disability benefits. So what does this all mean? It's a lot of a lot of background, a lot of a lot of information. Um, so again, prior to applying for any SS for SSI benefits or in some cases SSDI benefits, the first step is always to collect all of the medical documentation your client has available. Um, part of that is overseas medical documentation, if they have that. Um, and applying for disability benefits, I know that the examiner, the DDS examiner who's already been referred to, they tend to look at most recent evidence. Um, so treatment within the last 12 months is always, always emphasized. But if there's a history of someone dealing with a certain condition, any kind of historical information, any kind of records shows that it shows a pattern of um, connecting with services, not connecting with services, that shows the severity of symptoms, just have that readily available. So in some cases, if your client's coming from overseas and the documentation have some of the information, then that's why sort of this background of get people connected is so important. Um, can't stress that enough. Just you know, making sure you get them connected to medical services, mental health services, especially if you know there's a history there and if there might be some evidence, trying to build that up with the provider here um, to make sure that all the evidence is readily available for when you apply for benefits. Um, oh, sorry, touch second point. So again, upon arrival, as early as you can in the process, connect them to providers. Um, Impulse, but again, depending on what condition your client is claiming disability, maybe you connect them with a provider that addresses or that uh, treats that, that ailment. Um, there, are, if, so again, if a client is applying for benefits based on extensive severe mental history, there, you know, if this or if the records show that you know, they were they were diagnosed with schizophrenia at one point, 
make sure that you get them connected to men mental health psychiatrists as quickly as possible. Uh, oh, skipped over one. Um, to see culturally responsive and humble healthcare providers, humble in the sense that um, if they don't know, then they're able to connect your client with other services and understanding that there are, are cultural differences they might not know, um, but that they might be able to better refer you to somebody who can maybe address your client's issues uh, from a culturally responsive perspective. Um, advocate, you know, especially from a communication standpoint, um, sure that you provide the provider um, with as much context and chain client's condition as you have, so providing them with any overseas documentation, um, even anecdotal evidence, making sure you're writing notes, you know, uh, quotes from family members, quotes from community members, quotes directly from them about what it is they're dealing with, because sometimes stuff that is not covered in medical documentation, it can be covered through anecdotal evidence, through observational evidence, and that can help build um, that can help their provider with a case of what they're dealing with, but also further than the line can provide you with evidence of how you can, you're able to sort of present um, how, what your client is dealing with to Social Security, to the examiner. Um, so again, work with families, communities, to people connected, um, to dismantle stigmatization, and to gather some of that evidence. And as I already mentioned, be gathering that anecdotal and observational evidence. As far as the application process goes, um, it's you know sometimes it can feel kind of daunting. Um, I know a lot of people have asked about applying over the phone, going in person. I would always emphasize, and as like a tip, I would just always go in person. Or if you can't, um, I would always you can readily print out the Social Security the SSI application, the 8000 form online, and you know in the time with you and your client, with you and your individual, with an interpreter to kind of go through that and then take them into Social Security to submit it all at once. Um, there's always a possibility, you know, a lack of cultural responsiveness from any provider, from a medical provider, from a mental health provider, from SSA staff. And so just trying to, like, mitigate those barriers by doing what you can, doing the paperwork ahead of time always kind of helps out. Um, again, bring in professional interpreters. Family and friends are less likely to provide objective uh, work or interpretation. Um, and provide as much information as you can on the function and medical summary reports. So, depending on that, whether or not you're committing a complete SOAR um, claim, but you're going to have to fill out some kind of report that sort of goes more in depth into the condition um, after you know all the Social Security paperwork is said and done. And so, just making sure that you provide in those reports as much information as you can about um, your client's condition, about their symptoms, and about their functional impairments. Um, and so, again, taking whatever you have from medical documentation, taking from whatever you have from anecdotal um, document, or not documentation, but anecdotal evidence, making sure that you co like bring that together, coalesce that into these reports that perform sort of what it is your client is dealing with. Um, better rest soon. Give it one second. There's documents that are needed for the SSI application process, and I'm I'm focusing specifically on SSI because um, because of eligibility requirements beforehand, um, but also because depending on their arrival, that might be all they're eligible for. Um, if you want to help them apply for the SSDI application online, of course you should, and in many ways I definitely encourage to. Um, but as far as the SSI application process goes, this is what you need, and again, all of this is available online. So the SSI application, you can print that out. The 1696, which allows the claimant, allows the client to assign you as their uh, point of representation, um, their representative, um, just so you can kind of call Social Security on their behalf, kind of go back and forth, sort of see where things are at. Um, the consent for release of information, that provides Social Security with, um, that allows Social Security to divulge information to you. And the 827 is an authorization to disclose information. So if you want to share any kind of medical records with Social Security, you would have to have the 827 filled out. So I would say these are the four documents that need to be filled out prior to applying. Um, and again, optional, but not needed, depending on work history, depending on your client's condition, and that's the application could also be filled out. As far as functional and or the function and medical summary reports go, um, this is so after all of the formal application, all that paperwork is filled out, 
you're going to have to fill out one of these two reports depending on whether or not to source the claim. And again, the goal of both of these reports is to provide this comprehensive depiction of your client's personal, psychiatric, and functional impairments that may not be captured in available medical documentation. Um, so uh, you really want to emphasize that and really want to stress that it's more of a dysfunctional analysis. And that might seem counterintuitive as a provider, as a case manager, that you have to paint your client, you have to paint your patient in a way that sort of um, makes them look debilitating, but that's sort of why they're applying for disability benefits. You want to show the provider, you want to, well, you want to show full security, you want to show the examiner that because of their condition, because of these symptoms, they can function in very key ways. And Social Security outlines very deliberately sort of what they're looking at. So looking at how symptoms affect a client's ability to understand, remember, apply information, how they interact with others, so like they socialize, how they're able to concentrate and maintain pace, and how they can adapt themselves and how they can manage themselves. Um, and so this is all available online. Um, depending on your client's condition, you can go to Social Security's website. They have lists of um, what they call their Social Security listings, different conditions people can apply um, for disability benefits for. Um, and you can connect sort of symptoms to some of these uh, to these functional areas, and then again provide evidence in those key areas. So um, I know before we followed a lot of sort of the mental health listings, but you can go down to 12.04 and see that under depressive bipolar related disorders, that for depressive disorders there are multiple symptoms that somebody can be exhibiting, and then again those four um, key areas of functioning that you have to connect those symptoms to. So. Uh, can't stress this enough. Again, again we see whatever you hear, whether yeah, medical evidence, just make sure you connect those symptoms to how people um, are not are or are not able to manage um, those key areas. Long story short, connect all the dots. Um, connect their history, connect their medical history, connect what you see um, with again how the, how um, their inability to function. Um, and like sort of as a bit of advice, like what is it like for your client on their absolute worst day of functioning, and how does this connect to their mental health or their somatic symptoms, and how does that connect to their functioning? Um, some of us have good days, so we all have good days, we all have bad days. Some of uh, you know, you know, with the right environments, people can manage better than others, but without that, they can't. and so again, trying to figure out what's happening on that end, um, and definitely asking your clients. Um, sort of what are things like when they're not able to get out of bed or when they're not on medication or why don't they take medication? Um, again, functioning, how does that contribute? Um, again, like I already said, when all else fails, go back to the listings. Again, they're available online. Connect the things to mark limitations in areas of functioning. And I believe that's it on my end. Yes, great. Thank you so much. That was really comprehensive. Um, and I think it's really helpful. We had a lot of questions come in. Because I think it's starting to be, you know, just helpful to see how you use these techniques in this model um, on the ground. And so um, that's perfect. Uh, we're just going to wrap, start to wrap up a bit. Um, I just want to say keep those questions coming. I know we're not going to have a uh, much to cover, uh, just the tip of the iceberg here, but, but get your question in. We're going to compile them so we can respond to all of the questions that you're asking. So just because we're not doing it from the webinar, I want to make sure that we uh, leave no question unanswered in our follow-up. Um, really briefly, I hope we have interested you in learning more about SOAR and the SOAR model. Um, I wanted to preview our SOAR online course. This is on the website. It is completely free, uh, which I'm sure a lot of agencies will appreciate. Um, it's all open access on the web. Um, and what makes this training course unique is that while learning about uh, disability applications and how to help someone, you actually meet a fictional client and help him or her in uh, applying for disability. And so you complete those forms uh, that were covered in the presentation, and you, you turn them in, and then experts at the SOAR TA Center will individually review them, um, 
back um, for uh, each trainee through the course. So it's training across the country allows you to, um, you know, coordinate and follow up with your leaders. In I would say uh, one big plus of this is upon successful completion, uh, trainees receive 20 uh, CEUs from the National Association of Social Workers. So if you are licensed and looking for some free CEUs that are going to be you know, really beneficial to your work, I would encourage you to, to check this out. So the next steps from this, again, I said we're going to keep answering your questions um, in the next few days and over the next week while we work on getting the recording up. Um, learn more about saying, uh, learn about SOAR. Also, um, you know, coordinate with other agencies in your area. So if you're calling in from an area that has a few uh, agencies on this webinar, you know, talk amongst yourselves. Um, you know, uh, see what technical support you might need, and then get in touch with your SOAR Chase Center liaison or your state or local SOAR leads. And we have this directory listed here on the slide, and it's listed on that web page for this webinar too. Um, and then register for the SOAR online course if you are interested in uh, even more. Um, so we have some uh, for questions and answers, I'm also going to leave our contact information up for the SAMHSA floor TA Center. You can certainly reach out to us at any time. Um, one of the, so there are a couple of the top questions that seem to come in a few times. Um, one be on special immigrant visas um, and how they are, uh, were they eligible for these benefits and what kind of, if any, special documentation they would need. Um, so, uh, Diana or uh, Pearl, are you um, comfortable speaking on that? Um, yeah, I mean, so I never, I've never worked with anyone who's an SIV applied for benefits. Um, but as far as I know, from Social Security's website and from talking with some folks, um, it, it seems any SIVs who, or any Iraqi or Afghan nationals who are admitted to the U.S. as a special immigrant under an IV would qualify for SSI benefits if they served as a translator or interpreter with the U.S. Armed Forces in either country, um, or if they worked for the U.S. government in Iraq. So it's like very, I mean, unless, and I don't know if you know, but it's very, it seems very specialized, like very minute. Um, so if they served one of those, uh, if they served in either country, they would qualify from what I know. And, and as I told you before, even during the presentation, uh, sometimes it is always to actually refer uh, them to the local office for uh, application because one of our claims representatives can really take a look at uh, not just the immigration status, uh, but the different um, actions that they might qualify for. So it's important that we actually refer to them to the law office. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and, and it's a lot of the advice you'll hear from the SOAR TA Center, too, with these very specific questions about uh, eligibility for these is to, whenever in doubt, refer to Social Security to see if they might meet an exception um, and possibly be eligible for these benefits. Um, so thank you so much. Um, one of the questions, and, and Diane, I'm going to direct this to you, is there was, just for a clarification, there was some confusion about um, refugees and asylees being able to apply online versus in person. Um, Gerardo gave his best practice of what he, how he used to, or he does, you know, file applications typically on, in person when he can. Um, but I wanted to hear just to, to with you if an online option is available or whether in person is preferred for refugees and asylees. Um, I will say that most of the times people prefer to come to the office and the reason for that is because we have to provide uh, they have to provide their documentation. Um, I'm in practice, I know working in the community, people if you apply online which is available and we encourage the online application, especially for the portion in regards to the complete the disability report. But uh, as a, a, you know, work in the community, as I, as I said 
before, um, the commonalities that people do not want to put um, or follow up administration sent to the local office. Um, also because, you know, in a lot of cases, in terms of disability, we will prefer to see the person in the office. Um, these are all in regards to SSI, a lot that we have to do in regards to no medical issues. As uh, talking to the to the applicants about resources and arrangements, uh, the documentation that they have to present. There's an option for them. Of course, you know that the SSI application is limited to children. If the person has ever applied, you know, they cannot apply online. So that's what we, we encounter. I would recommend uh, an, an application in the local office and make a call, of course, to get a appointment. That's really helpful hearing uh, for both of you, your, your personal recommendations. Um, so we've got one more time for one last question, um, and I'm going to direct this to uh, her. Uh, there are a few questions about gathering medical documentation, and I think you did a, a great job of covering your tips and how to do it, and, and sometimes there's just a concern about what happens when you're working with someone and, you know, you can tell they, they do have, you know, symptoms of mental illness and, uh, you know, limitations in their functioning, but they don't have extensive medical documentation. What would be the, your first couple steps in working with that individual? Yeah, I mean, but, but, I mean, it's also being like sort of realistic about what being realistic with expectations. So kind of letting them know that um, like an extensive process that Social Security and the federal government they go, they do their due diligence to making sure that people qualify for these benefits based on you know, medical history, and so to know, letting the client or the claimant know that, I mean, unfortunately, evidence is needed. Um, that's formal evidence and other forms of evidence, and so just expectations, but also using that as a put driver to get people connected. Um, so, you know, if your client isn't connected already, they're skeptical about getting connected, um, but they're angry over why, you know, they don't qualify, like, they, they X, Y, Z, it's like, well, yeah, you this or your family might say this, but that's not what your doctor is saying or that's not what documents from overseas are saying. Um, give it brevity. And so being realistic with people, setting those expectations, make sure they get connected with um, their providers and keeping those open lines of communication open with the provider, with the client, with the family, with the community, um, gathering all that other sort of anecdotal evidence um, so that that can come to you once the medical documentation is gathered. But um, I mean, it really is like a long process. And like there are only clients that I've worked with at RD and that I worked with here at ACH who, you know, had it multiple times. And you know, multiple times they were denied, you know, some lack of medical evidence, sometimes for a lack of follow up on either end. And that's just, it just comes with this whole process is that for some, it's going to take time. It's going to fall up with your provider. It's going to take maintaining that relationship with your provider and just emphasizing all that. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for that. So I would just want to take the time to, again, thank everybody for their questions and reassure you that we are going to be answering uh, your questions in our follow-up. Uh, we will not leave you hanging on these, these excellent uh, queries. But I am going to pass it back over to Sarah to give just a few closing remarks for us. Thank you so much to our presenters, Jen, Diana, and Gerardo, for the excellent information provided during today's webinar. Uh, takeaways for me going to the presentation was really to prepare before going to Social Security to apply for SSI benefits for refugees, asylees, parolees, SIVs, um, and other eligible uh, populations. Uh, to document everything, document what family members say, what providers say, what others um, you know, connected to the client say to use as, as evidence or to, um, to add on to the final report that the client will receive in mail, um, but to document thoroughly. 
uh, to refer um, clients to medical professionals early, especially those that are related to their to their disability, which I know that you would do anyway, um, and to make sure to give specific contact information for those medical providers to Social Security to facilitate their work, um, and to be informed about uh, the SSI application process so that you can know uh, what is happening, what uh, evidence is important, and what will facilitate the decision of uh, EDS and from Social Security. I highly recommend uh, the SOAR online course uh, and um, to get together based on your locality, perhaps via the quarterly consultation meetings with other resettlement agencies in the area and reach out as a group to the SOAR contact in your state to what a partnership might look like between uh, between the resettlement professionals um, and experts in um, in SSI, um, perhaps a training partnership. I know at a where uh, I used to uh, do case management. We had case managers, resettlement case managers who were SOAR trained um, by the state folks, um, or we can uh, be kept in the loop as to uh, trainings in your locality. Um, um, or be familiar with one another in case uh, you, you cross paths in another way. So uh, I hope this was helpful for everybody. I know that it was helpful for me, and I hope that it will inform our work and enable us to more fully, ser uh, fully serve our refugee clients. Uh, thank you again to our presenters, and I wish everybody a great week.